Oh, they're up here. They're, they're, they're up there over on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> over, over on our side. Over there. <laughs> okay. Wherever you, you can sit wherever you like. Yeah. <laughs> they're the only ones left. You can sit up here if you'd like. They're the only ones left in the country. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. Yeah. That, they, they are. Sure. Sure. Come on up. We're, it'll be live. It's going to be live streamed. For all of those at home, cozy at home. That's right. For all those people who <laughs> refuse to come on. <laughs> yeah. No, that makes sense. He was probably going to bite the table. Yeah, table does that. Yeah. Okay. Does everybody want to meet each other? I'm just really comfortable in my house with this stuff. Yeah, well, I think some people know each other. Yeah. <laughs> oh. This is Linda Branson. <laughs> Lydia. Uh, did I say Linda? No. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I, I, I much worse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. This is Lydia Branson, who called me real quick and has worked with for a long yeah. time at uh, Sam Anthony's and now at BBS. And this is her daughter. <laughs> who is here? Her seal. Her seal. I'm sorry, but I went with Lily. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and this is Spencer Tolbert and my friend and the normal man. <laughs> and Kevin. 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 And Dave. <laughs> and Kendra. And Kendra. Yeah, and then we have Ron who's going to make an appearance oh, at some point. <laughs> He's. Wedged between some books at the moment. <laughs> He's in his little safety zone. See, we didn't start this live streaming today. Mm -mm. No, we were going to wait a few minutes. I haven't tried to do the show since. Yeah. This, uh, my debut came out in 2017. I know, feels like a million years ago, but. I mean, was it fun for you? Um. We did, maybe you, but yes, uh, we did a book launch and the whole dance back in 2017. Okay. It was quite the time. Yeah. So I'm excited to celebrate my mom's book Here's launch. Here's another really bad sleeping habit. I know. That's true. That's perfect. I can't sleep. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I'm doing this for you. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, sure. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you, all of all of you, for coming. You, you, yeah. You're going in my will. <laughs> I had in mind that you would be going in my will. <laughs> and so we're gonna open and open it up to questions at the end. So feel free with the raciest, most provocative questions you can think of. It is quite congested in downtown Glen Park. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we may have some folks coming in. <laughs> Fantastic. So, yeah, thank you for coming out. We have Carol Gigliotti here, too. <laughs> yeah. Yay. She has thank you. published this book to wide acclaim and, and immense amounts of media coverage, <laughs> podcasts everywhere you go, interviews everywhere you go. <laughs> But this is a book launch. So, um, yeah, and she's joined by Paul de Laurent. Happens to be her son and also the author of One Way Down or Another. Oh, it's here. Cool guys. So they'll, uh, they'll, they'll keep you entertained for a while. <laughs> All right? Yes. You're All right. Thank you, Eric. I'm a fan off in the restroom. I highly recommend that any time you're coming out of there. Okay. Um, and, yeah, have a good All time. Right. Thanks for coming out. Thank, Thank you, you, Eric. Good. Um, well, welcome everyone. As Eric said, uh, we're here to celebrate Carol Giliotti's book launch Thank for um, what is an incredible book, The Creative Lives of Animals. Um, I think we should just kick it off by saying, you know, as uh, being an author myself, um, learning that all of the books for the first print run that uh, were available have sold out is a pretty unbelievable thing. And we found out uh, that, that that has happened for my mom's book. So... We're excited for them to make more <laughs> so that more folks will be able to um, be able to enjoy the book. Um, and tonight we're gonna um, we're gonna do some reading 
We're going to ask some questions. Um, and we're going to learn all about uh, as much as we can. There's a lot in this book, so it's, it's exciting. We're going to learn all about uh, how things are going with you. So um, welcome, everybody. Uh, first thing, I just thought we'd get it rolling uh, just uh, with a little bit of a theme um, around animals in fiction and nonfiction. Um, I write fiction. My mom writes nonfiction. Um, and I thought I was going to just kick it off and kind of ask you, you know, what do you see as uh, the role for animals in, in fiction and nonfiction? Do you have any thoughts to come to mind? Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think what's interesting is that um, though, you know, animals have been written about always, as long as there's been any kind of literature, um, that a lot of uh, people are actually writing book, really incredible books of fiction um, with you know animals as the narrator, animals as the primary character. Um, there's really a lot out there. It's really, really exciting. And nonfiction, um, there are many books out right now besides mine that talk about animals as you know emotional, in, intelligent beings with consciousness, of course, and all kinds of qualities. So that's really exciting for me, particularly, and for Calder, because both of us have been um, pretty committed to animal issues and animal activism and for animal rights for many years. So it's, it's quite, quite the time right now. And, and as far as my book is concerned, I think it's an idea whose time has come. I would agree with that. Um, it can get contentious between us because I'm vegetarian, she's vegan. So <laughs> it's not always smooth it. sailing, you know. <laughs> um, but with that, why don't we start, because I think people would love to hear uh, you read a little bit from the book. Why don't we start with the first uh, excerpt that you were going to read for folks. And for those of you at home, because we are live streaming, you know, get cozy, make a drink, whatever you need to do. Just make sure I'm on the right page. Um, so just a little introduction. I'm reading from um, uh, Creating Built Environments, which is the fourth chapter. So there's obviously a lot that goes before this, but I really thought this was, at least for me, one of the most amazing um, sections when I uh, started to write this and I got to know about... Um, the research on honeybees, because most of us think of insects, well, I don't, but <laughs> many people think of insects as, you know, kind of just instinctual. They're just, you know, like little robots that are doing their things. So this, well, definitely, I know all of you probably know this already, but I, the people who are watching, this will really change your mind. In late spring or early summer, colonies of honeybees swarm. The swarming entails the queen bee and approximately half the worker bees leaving to establish a new colony. This allows a daughter queen and the rest of the workers to continue living and working in the old colony. Now the new colony must find a new and advantageous site to call home. In the 1950s, Martin Lindauer, a German postdoctoral student studying with Karl von Frisch at the University of Munich, noticed that the bees on the surface of the swarm he was watching were performing waggle dances. Um, unlike those foragers bearing nectar and pollen, whose dancing indicated the lo location of valuable food sources, these bees seemed to be scouts. He wondered, were they waggle dancing to advertise choice sites they had found? After a great deal of painstaking observation, including um, a dot recorded, including dot recorded um, dancing bees with a blue paint dot, Lindauer made several discoveries. The first was that only a few hundred of the thousands of bees in the swarm were active during this early phase of the decision-making process. These scouts flew from the swarm, finding and then inspecting potential nest sites. They then returned to the swarm to perform waggle dances. The second remarkable finding was that initially, 
Um, the bees pointed to many sites, but in a matter of hours, the number of sites advertised by the scouts shrank to one site, which was then reported excitedly by dozens of bees. To Lindauer's delight, once the dancing bees focused on one site, soon the entire cluster of bees would suddenly fly towards this site. He knew that the dancing bees had scouted and reported the final site, but he still didn't know how the scouts had agreed on this particular site. In the mid-1990s, Seeley, and that's Thomas Seeley who wrote Bee Democracy, and his colleagues decided to revisit Lindauer's research to find out exactly how the scout bees implemented the very precise wish list for the perfect honey bee colony lo location. According to several investigators since Lindauer, and this is a quote, a first-rate home for a honeybee colony has a cavity volume greater than 20 liters, an entrance hole that is smaller than 30 square centimeters, perched several meters, meters off the ground, facing south, and located at the floor of the cavity. No small list for these home seekers and one whose precision requires both memory and intelligence to fulfill. Implementing video equipment, Seeley and his colleagues worked with smaller swarms of about 4,000 bees, identified each bee and recorded each, each dance um, performed by each bee scout. Um, let me just make sure this is, yes, oh, okay. So we're gonna skip to, um, his descriptions of the honeybees, and this is talking about, no, you know what, that is, sorry. Um, implementing video equipment, so we read that. Uh, two days details, however, begin to chip away at the conclusion. No evidence for the scout bees polling their fellow dancers was visible, and occasionally the swarm launched into flight when there were still two strong nest site contenders left. What if a quorum, a sufficient number of scouts, was used? The bees' behavior after the quorum is reached, called piping, is understood. This special high-pitched sound, signaling the non-scouts to begin warming their flight muscles, takes over um, an hour. Because of this, usually there is enough time for the quorum to shift to a consensus before the entire swarm takes flight. How the scout bees know there is a quorum is still not understood, but how the best nest is chosen is. And here's where it really gets interesting, at least for me. The bees fly to the new nest in unison. Seeley and his colleagues, however, affirm that a quorum is the essence of the bees' group decision-making process. I can hear you asking, how is this creative? Is voting creative? Well, it depends on how one comes to cast one's vote. How do bees collectively choose the best home? For humans, collectively making good decisions is often fraught with dissent. Compromising may involve only a few requirements to make a successful decision. More often, the process results in a complete stalemate. If you have sat on a committee, you will know this to be true. <laughs> but there are times when things seem to flow, members appear more open to innovative strategies, or they listen and try to understand others' positions. The resulting decisions are sizable improvements over those emanating from committees where discord rules the day. Thinking of creativity as a wide angle perspective through which to consider various intentions is what the creative process is all about. Today's business culture has embraced creative process theory, or at least its version of the theory, to boost sales. Seely, after years of studying honeybees, suggests bees nest site selection behavior can provide guidance on this topic, for it is clear they are successful at making collective judgments. His description of the honeybee's successful decision-making process to find the best nest reads like a how-to for creative decision-making. 
He offers three significant factors bees rely on to make a successful decision. The first rests on how the group of scouts, up to seven, several hundred members, is organized in a decentralized way. There is no individual or small group of leaders. Rather, each scout is a free agent able to search independently. This allows for the collection of a profusion of alternative nest sites from which to choose. The scouts share all their suggestions through waggle dancing, from those suggestions that are poor to the, view, the few that seem to fit the bill. This ensures that the best possible site will be considered. The second factor is the competition that ensues among the scouts advertising for their particular alternative. Soon there are adherents to some of the sites and those small group alliances recruit new members by forming waggle dances varying in enthusiasm, enthusiasm for the quality of the site. One particularly important indicator of the value of this process is that when an uncommitted scout, this is one of my favorite parts, is recruited to a site, she first examines the site herself and if she deems it worthy, only then does she dance to recruit more bees to the cause. This independence of judgment is essential for such an important decision. Thank you. You're welcome. Wonderful. Um, I think it, it brings up a lot of questions in my mind. We'll have a little time to have more specific questions. But, you know, this idea of um, bees, insects, um, democracy, decision making, I think it's at the forefront of so many people's minds right now in our, in our society. How do we collectively make decisions that have a, a positive impact on our, our lives? Yeah. You know, and you brought up so many great points in that passage. Um, but I just wonder, you know, for you as you wrote this book, um, what were some of the kind of central themes that you kept coming back to as you learned more and more about different animals and how they create and share and democratize in some ways? You know? Yeah, well, one of them, I think one of the things that I was really happy to find um, all this research on is the individuality of even each individual bee. Um, the idea that in this particular brainstorming activity that there was no leader, each individual bee goes around and decides, oh, this looks like a good site. And then other bees decide on their own if they think that's a good site or not. So that kind of um, <laughs> individual creativity uh, and, and I do think it is creative because, again, this is like a manual for brainstorming. When I taught for so many years, a lot of times students would just pick the first thing. They'd say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And then you couldn't shift them off that to save your life. Um, if they had only moved, you know, <laughs> but no. So those kinds of things, I think, at least for me, were really, really important and I do take your point, and I, I said it in the book, we could really learn a lot about democracy <laughs> from animals, and in this case, bees. That's remarkable. Um, so the theme tonight is uh, animals in fiction and nonfiction. So uh, in that light, I'm going to read a short passage from my novel that came out in 2017, One Way Down or Another. Um, and then we're going to continue on with Carol's book launch party. Um, you don't need to know much except this is set in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. Um, the book is about a young man who comes out of a drug and rehab program and tries to stay sober over the week of Christmas. We rolled the bins up and around the corner, on up Golden Gate Avenue towards Leavenworth. The security guard was handing out more tickets as we passed. He was trying to keep up with the expanding line of seniors, keep up with hand after open hand. There was no sunlight on that side of the street, and the wind caught up underneath my shirt. We passed St. Boniface Church, its heavy wooden doors open so people could finish sleeping in the pews, leave at their leisure. There were something like eight or nine structures in the courtyard, a tent city constructed out of shopping carts and burned-out couches and baby carriages, all insulated with blue tarps and wool blankets. 
Mass was coming, and soon the men and women of that courtyard would be packing their rough-and-ready wagons. Soon they'd be asked to hit the road. We passed a gated grade school, an intake psych facility, and a clinic, which filled prescriptions for the neighborhood. Out front of the clinic, there was another line, lots of people leaning on the glass. And across from that line, there was a kid who was chilled out on a mailbox, maybe 18 with a long white shirt, dreads, a pencil mustache, and a black ball cap. He never looked up from his phone, but sung to us as we passed. Oxy, oxy, oxy. I'd thought about it, and I was sure it worked like this. You wait in line, fill your prescription, walk out, negotiate a price with the kid, and then walk off with enough cash to buy groceries or a certain shampoo you like or something for somebody you support. And it might cost you relief from whatever pain had taken hold of you, but it was better than trying to live it out on disability or SSI. And you knew that, and the kid knew that, and so it would go and go and go. Every time I had to pass that corner, I felt thankful that pills weren't my thing. If he had been singing the booze song, it had been different. I watched Ray start to pull ahead, his full weight behind the bin, his feet picked up, and then I felt the wind again, stinging my armpits until I bore down and caught up to where Ray stood. The two of us waiting in the wind while a rusted chain pulled the security gate open. And then there it was. But Ray didn't notice. He was engrossed with his task, walked right past it, and so I thought, I'll follow him and play it out. We slammed the bins next to the dumpsters, and I thought, don't you dare laugh. The thing about Ray was that he hated birds. Specifically, he hated city birds, pigeons, seagulls. We'd had more than one conversation about it, and when I pressed him, he said that he didn't feel the same about birds that lived in the woods or up in the mountains or down at the beach. He said that the wild birds were cleaner, that they didn't eat from the streets and the dumpsters, didn't chow down on the meals people puked up around here. He called them filthy, those birds that gobbled down the squandered meals we prepared and served. He said that he'd seen pigeons dancing in our pink punch, prancing in piles of undigested noodles, and he hated those birds. And then one day I said, but pigeons are one of the few things I can stand in this city. They're resilient as all hell. They do the best they can with what they got. And then Ray kicked me out of his office, told me to get back to damn work to stop bothering him. Ray's hands were on his hips, a bleached white kitchen rag on his shoulder. His radio was clipped to the back of his belt. And there we were, surrounded on three sides by empty brick buildings. The windows hollowed, the small private parking lot overwhelmed with the smell of the ripened trash compactor, and I could hear children playing, their cries leaping and escaping from the walled-in playground at the school. Ray looked disgusted. He looked like a child who tasted his first bad taste. He said, they're making a damn mess of everything. This had been happening for the last couple of months. Someone had broken in again and dumped garbage bags, about 10 industrial bags heaped off to the side of the gate. I'd thought about it, and I figured that they probably tossed the stuff out of a pickup truck, the front of the vehicle holding open the broken entryway. Figured they probably didn't want to pay the compost fee. Because usually we'd find the bags filled with stale bread, and then we'd hulk the stuff to the dumpster. And then we'd agree not to tell Ray, so that we could linger a few extra minutes, even if the rain was hitting us like spittle, even if it meant cleaning up somebody else's mess. I was going to say to Ray that we should just clean it up, that it was no big thing except this time the contents had spilled out of some of the bags, dinner rolls and hot dog buns and sliced loaves. And there was a large puddle that had formed underneath and around the bags. A few birds were congregating at the base of the mountain of plastic and old bread. It was the birds Ray was pointing at. A seagull landed and pecked at a piece of sponge sliced wheat bread. Its web feet splashed and slapped in the brownish green water. It hopped a few feet away and gobbled down the soaked up scraps. And I was going to try and make Ray feel better, but then he said, they fucking ruin everything. And I thought, the birds don't keep dumping these bags of bread. And then I thought, if I was a bird around here, I sure would want some bread. And I thought about the parrots that live in the city. And then I remembered that the week before I'd spotted a hawk perched on the top of the church. But in my haste for a rebuttal, what I blurted out was, I've seen parrots. It's not all pigeons and seagulls in this town. And Ray asked, what the fuck are you telling me? Do you see any damn parrots? And then he said, 
I don't see any parrots messing up this parking lot. Any damn parrots messing up my day? At least they'll eat what no one else wants, I said. Well, Ray said, then maybe we should take a damn picture. Tell the world about this little miracle. He swung his rag at a pigeon that was bobbing at his boot and nodded and then stepped back into the mix along with the seagulls. Ray said, look at all this damn bread. I ain't cleaning up this shit. He took another swing. Now we're in for it. And he was right. Because while we were hauling off at each other, one of the seagulls was rousing the local pigeon population. And then like that, they started ascending from the branches that hung over the security fence. They dropped from the rooftops. They came from everywhere, and suddenly we were in the midst of a frenzied pack of pigeons, mauled and mangled and broken red feet that sprung and bound on everything. The hood of a car, the garbage bags, the puddle, and even our splattered boots. Ray stepped backwards. He tripped over himself while yelling at the birds. It was tough to make out what he was saying with all those little wings in motion. He kept catching grunts and a few, you damn birds. And that was when Ray yanked out the microphone on his two-way radio. He held it near his mouth like he was going to call for help. And he was right in, this, right in that sense. Because if you were ever in trouble and you called an emergency code over the radio, then help would arrive in the form of Big Rob and his security team. They'd come rescue you if need be. But you needed a location and you'd need to state the problem. Down in the kitchen, I'd heard codes called for guys fighting and heart attacks. And I'd even heard calls for hit and runs out in the street but I was sure I'd never heard an assistance call for a frenzied group of pen pecking pigeons. And that must have been what crossed Ray's mind because he clipped the microphone back onto the pocket of his pants and headed for the gate in full retreat. He said, don't you dare move. You stay with the damn birds. I'm going to find us some help. <laughs> Little bird interaction going on. Um, <laughs> But when I was reading your book, um, I was kind of struck by a passage in the introduction uh, that got me thinking because uh, having worked in the Tenderloin for so long, we were always surrounded by pigeons and seagulls yeah. and, and, yeah. and birds. Yeah. Um, and there's a passage, the passage reads, birds, long accused of being stupid, possess perspective and cognitive abilities that serve as the basis for their intricate social behaviors. Birds, scientists have now learned, have complex brains as inventive as any mammalian brain. And, you know, it really struck me in, with that patch, passage about stigma in general, you know, um, stigma yeah. that we, um, you know, use for uh, people in the world, stigma that we use for animals, um, and, and per how perception is such, plays such a huge role in how we interact with, with the world. Um, and also how we sort of justify our treatment of other people and animals. And I thought um, maybe you could just speak to that a little bit, you know? Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that part of the book. I asked him if he would read <laughs> that, book, um, that part. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really obvious that we know very little about animals, um, which is one of the reasons I, you know, wrote the book. Um, and, and we, you know, we continue to sort of even though there's so many books out about, you know, like, I think it's Diane Ackerman, The, the Genius of Birds. It's not Diane Ackerman, it's Jennifer Ackerman. And yet, when we look at turkeys or chickens or pigeons, gulls sometimes, though people are a little bit lenient when it comes to <laughs> gulls because they belong with the ocean and people are happy when they're by the ocean. Um, you really see kind of, you know, where prejudice and bigotry comes from because, you know, there's a section in the book on, in the intelligence chapter on pigeons and how incredibly smart they are. Um, Dave sounds like he's been, he <laughs> seems like you know this, right? Um, it's, you know, that was early on in my research and you realize that pigeons um, can, you know, have think abstractly, which is something that, you know, you kind of think, oh, wow, in what way? Well, they're able to make analogies. 
And creativity, of course, lives and breathes on analogies. Um, you know, artists of all kinds are giving you this information to try to explain to you what it is they're really talking about. Um, and that just hit me like a ton of bricks at the very beginning of the research. So I decided, yeah, uh, there was a, needed to be pigeons. And in the book, too, I, I have a section on my relationship with pigeons um, in the very cold, uh, rainy Vancouver um, winters when I would come to Emily Carr, where I worked, Emily Carr University of Art and Design and Park. And then I'd spend my, a little bit of my time before I had to go in to teach my class talking to the pigeons. And, <laughs> you know, they're so beautiful. I mean, if you really look at, you know, they're so iridescent and um, they, they're making these beautiful little cooing sounds and um, <laughs> a friend of mine um, actually <laughs> came upon me and said, were you talking to the pigeons? <laughs> Just like that. I was like, yeah. <laughs> and you know, it hit me, yeah, gee, not everybody feels, I guess, about pigeons the way I do. <laughs> but that idea of, you know, how bigotry and it, just how bigoted we all are, whether it's against a particular species um, or all other species other than us or you know, within our human species, we always have to say, well, this, this culture isn't as good as our culture, or this person, you know, these people. So yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. And, and I don't know how we get past that. I think we get past that maybe by, you know, learning that I think that really, we are really only one of, what, eight billion other species so that's something to consider, I think, anytime anybody has some thought about being really uppity about <laughs> the fact that they're a human. <laughs> um, would you in, indulge us in one, one more yes, passage? Yes, I, I would. From the and book? this one is, is, it's a little more exciting than the other, the other <laughs> passage, as a matter of fact. Now I have to find it. Um, the last chapter of the book is called Culture Across Species. And, and so I have to just explain a little bit that when I first started writing the book, uh, culture in animals was pretty contentious. And there were scientists who were really saying, absolutely, they have culture. They're all, all different kinds of species have culture, um, of, cultures of their own. They're a particular kind of culture. And, and within those cultures, it's not just that one species has, species has one whole culture, it's that different groups of animals within that species might have very different forms of culture. Maybe they eat different things than other, um, other members of that species do, or maybe the songs are different. Or, so with, you know, the kinds of ways that culture mm. is is created certainly has to do with how creative the um, you know the individuals and then the groups of of members are. So culture, of course, is made up of of individual. I think individual and group creativity. So this particular passage is. Um, about a particular culture, cultures that I visited, um, I guess in 2004. A large brown hairy head pops up above the tall, gently rolling sedge grass. It quickly rises further on top of a massive shaggy chest, an enormous mo nose to the wind, eyes squinting in our direction. I have no time to register the fear I expected but do not feel, as just below and to the right of the first head, another slightly smaller head appears, duplicating the rising behavior. The effect is so comical and charming in its artlessness that any anxiety I have had about this moment vanishes. 
The mother grizzly and one of her cubs have scented and seen us and now ponder whether we will bring them any trouble. Their visible anxiety calms my own. The mother drops onto all fours, camouflaging her from our position on a hollow red cedar log about a hundred feet away. There is a pause as Doug, our guide, turns to us and brings his, fingers, his finger to his lips. Then he says, almost inaudibly, here she comes. We are not sure for a moment where she will appear, closer to us through the grass or farther away headed towards the riverbank. When she appears about 50 feet to our left, lumbering through the sedge grass with her two cups, cubs following close behind, she appears to be taking her time. She glances at us every so often, giving us a very wide berth. When she reaches the closer and shallower arm of the estuary, she stops and takes one long look just to make sure we are staying put and then wades knee deep into the rushing water. The cubs follow close behind. They too throw glances our way, but more directly, swiveling their heads as far back as they can while still moving. All three disappear for a second behind the jumbled roots of an enormous rotten and fallen cedar just this side of the bank. And then the mother grizzly is in the water, wading in up to our flanks, crossing the wider arm of the river, still turning her head our way for a few quick looks. The first cub enters the water when her mother is about halfway across, but the water is up around her neck and so she paddles strenuously, struggling to get a purchase on the opposite rocky shore. Still lingering near the tree trunk, the second cub, captivated by something he is sniffing on the ground in front of him, suddenly turns directly towards us and stares. Despite the constant whistle of wind, I hear a group intake of breath from everyone but Doug. Just as suddenly the cub turns and splashes into the water, swimming furiously to catch up with his sibling and mother. The other cub turns to greet him from the shore, but the second cub continues until he emerges from the water further downstream, sniffing his way along the shore and through the brush and sedge until all three of them disappear. The wind still whistles through our hoods and parkas, but we are quiet. As much as the bears must have been taking in our scent, it occurs to me that I only smelled them in one strongly pungent gust as they passed us going to the stream. It is that unforgettable odor, even more than seeing the bears so closely, that allows me to register the truth of them. I saw a grizzly bear and her two cubs less than 50 feet from me. Slowly, the four of us turned to each other with gleeful and awed looks, though few words. We are all speechless. I know that an important moment in my life has just occurred, a pivot upon which other experiences will revolve, not so much in comparison, but in reverberation. The world, as pre previously perceived, will now have to be reconsidered. I had known that wild animals had their own lives and families, but seeing and smelling the mother bear and her cubs in their homeland shift my somewhat intellectual notion of wild animals' lives to a visceral understanding of these specific bears in their home. One of the most valuable experiences of my life and one that opened my eyes to animals as members of families and cultures was this stay with the Kittisu Hai Hai First Nation in the village of Klemto on the island of Princess Royal in northern British Columbia home to the spirit bear. There was no lodge as there is now, only a swaying float house to stay on. Getting there took two plane rides, a water taxi, and a tumultuous ferry that only ran twice a week. There are still no roads there. It is the wildest place, that's in quotes, I have ever been to and also the most outrageously gorgeous. When I say wild, I mean that for most of the great bear, the ratio of humans to land is quite low, and so compared to many places on Earth, untouched by humans. Klemtu's name is for Klemduok, a 
Simpian word meaning impassable. When I was there in 2006, Klemtu's population was 420, and in 2007, it was 505. The Kitasu Hai Hai, along with other First Nations bands, it's a visiting dog, <laughs> um, he really wants in to listen, and hundreds of species of animals call this area home. Kitasu Hai Hai First Nations assume strong ties to animals in this indigenous community, community um, because their culture and heritage are directly connected in their intimacy with the land, sea, and animals surrounding them. Historically, specific animals are clan members, including the spirit bear, grizzlies with white fur, brown grizzlies, black bears, wolves, eagles, raven, orca, and salmon. Protection of predators in their environment comes from a deeply held culture of kinship with the animals they live with every day, often seen elsewhere as ferocious, as evil, or as hunting trophies. I experienced firsthand how intimately knowledgeable Doug and his fellow bandmates are about bears they recognize and know year after year. Doug disclosed how he often attempted to understand the bear's reactions to color by wearing different colored clothes on different days. Images of that stayed with me and eventually filtered into my thoughts on creativity in animals. That day at Muscle Inlet, there were five of us, including Doug and myself. After our journey there by tugboat through glacier-carved fjords, past sparkling inlets and dense green islands, one visitor with us finally asked Doug, what was in the case he was carrying. It was obviously she was hoping he would say it was a gun. A camera, chuckled Doug. He explained that there was no need for a gun. Bringing a gun only made things tense, fostering a feeling of distrust, he said. He did not actually say that bringing a gun fostered a feeling of mistrust in the bears and in the onlookers, but having spent time with him, I knew this was what he meant. The cultures of Kitasu Hai Hai and the cultures of the animals who live in the Great Bear Rainforest are entwined, recognized on both sides and respected, something we could all learn from. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Great passage. Um, I'm sure people are interested in going to British Columbia now. Mm -hmm. Oh, do. Yeah. It's incredible. It's such a beautiful place. To, especially to where the Clem to live. And they now have a lodge. It's very comfortable, I hear. <laughs> I, on the float plane, I literally, you'd be like, you know, and you'd think, am I moving? <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> or not the float plane, the float uh, lo little thing that we stayed on. <laughs> Um, I want to leave a little time for questions, yes. but I have some questions for you. Okay. Um, can you talk about the difference between creativity hmm. and innovation? Yes. That's, that's a question that NPR asked me, I think, or somebody <laughs> did. Um, create, uh, in, for me, creativity um, is something that is universal and is... Um, and I give a definition in the book that encompasses all species. But it, it is something generally, I think, that exists in the universe and that every part of the universe is part of that creativity. And I kind of say that in the book. I actually do say it, but the definition for the sake of the book is a little different. So you have to kind of read sometimes between the lines. Um, innovation is something I think that's very human-like and it has to do with product. And in terms of creativity, there doesn't need to be a product. In fact, there doesn't even th need to be anything that is considered new or, or something that is produced. It can be an idea it can be an exploration, something that, you know, 20 years later someone might think about and then maybe do something with that. Um, but I, I think innovation um, 
This idea that progress is absolutely essential is problematic, and uh, that, that to me it, it makes innovation sort of less than the wider idea of creativity. Mm. You can only assume Elon Musk is watching this live. <laughs> Perhaps he'll take I that am. into account as he goes forward. <laughs> um, the other thing that I was really interested in to talk to you about is um, there's this idea of little C and big C. And obviously called her Carol. We can argue all day who's little C is big C. Um, You're big C. But <laughs> in the context of creativity, the little C and the big C, um, what, how does that connect to our understanding of animals, this idea Mm -hmm. of little c being individual and the big c being cultural well i again i think that idea that was for me one of the most important things was this was proof that individual animals are absolutely essential and in the epilogue you know i talk a lot about the fact that if we don't understand that individual animals with their individual creativity and fitting that into their life and their habitat and their family, um, we really don't understand how we can conserve animals, how we can stop species extinction, because it's really important that we understand that there are essential members and we don't always know who those members are of a particular culture or species. Well, species may be, but in that particular clan or that particular group. And so, for instance, killing off a certain number of wolves is not going to really conserve wolves because you've decimated a family and you've decimated perhaps probably an individual who was very important in their role in that group. So unless we, and there are people who are Philippa Brakes, um, whose uh, research I came across while I was working on the epilogue, and I was really happy um, about that because that was relatively new, I, a new piece of research on this very idea that individuality that those individuals are important mm -hmm. not just oh we got to save all the squirrels or well a lot of people don't think we should but of course we should because they're part of a whole habitat right but we have to save this animal as opposed to this animal um you know we really don't understand what we're doing and that's why we're in this situation okay and um you know now that uh, the book has been highlighted on NPR, I think there's going to be people out there, there's going to be readers, they're going to want to know Carol Giuliotti, the author. And so, <laughs> yes. as your son, I, I, have to, I have to wonder, you know, um, what, are, what are two things, and you, you spoke about the experience up in British Columbia, which is fantastic, but maybe two experiences, life milestones, something that, that has brought you to, to Carol Giuliotti, the author. Why did you have to say the author? But I you do are. think, well, actually, you've, you've really influenced me. First of all, that, that, you know, you were kind of writing when you were little. I mean, you were literally writing stories when you were little. And, you know, what, like six or something, and you'd, you'd tell me stories over the phone when you were at your dad's and... Um, I think you've been a big influence in my life. Thank you. I, that wasn't a self-serving question. <laughs> no, I don't think he knew I happy was Happy gonna... that we, we got there. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, and then, and then I don't know what else. Uh, my new grandson. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm also a mother. And actually, there's a lot about mothering, yeah. whether you're a man or whether you're, an, uh, you know, a an alligator or an ant. There's a lot about mothering in, in the book and how important that is and how creative mothering is. And I don't think we, we really understand or really give credit to people, whoever they are, who mother and how um, 
important that is in our culture. And animals seem to understand that a little better. Well, I think for, you know, it's your son, what came up for me was uh, you just, a few days ago, you were in the retelling of the 50th anniversary of Snow White, Lou Stein's Snow White, that originally was... Uh, Bartleby's... Uh, yeah. Bartleby's yeah. Snow White. Yeah. In Chicago in 1970... 71? Yeah, yes. 1970 White. Yeah. So, and Carol, uh, along I... with many others who were in the production and also supported the production, did a retelling and so carol the actor comes up for me when i think when i when i read this book um and i think carol the painter uh from from your life of uh the dante series that you you did that lived in our home for a very long time i mean for me growing up my mom's art was all over the house and it had a huge impact on me and i i can sometimes i, I feel like i can feel that coming out in your writing mm -hmm. um i think that's that's, cool. that's uh, a big piece of, of sort of the the author you are today. So um, that said, we wanted to have a moment to open it up. If anybody um, maybe had a question uh, for Carol, obviously a huge congratulations. The book is Thank you, being very well received. Uh, we're really excited. Uh, another NPR piece is coming up in the future, so that's we, great. We can mention it has been a long haul. It has been a long, yeah. long as, as many authors know. <laughs> but yeah, does anyone have a question that perhaps they'd like to ask? And it's okay if not, just... Linda! Have... No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, Lydia. First of all, I wanted to say thank you for this, this book. I'm very excited to read it. Um, I am a pigeon lover. Oh, cool! <laughs> yes. I did not know that. I yes. knew I liked you. Yes, <laughs> I, I, it's, you know, it's so interesting because um, Calder and I also have worked together for a long time and in the tenderloin and stuff, and people are really just obnoxious about pigeons, and they are beautiful, and when I let people know that, I was like, I love rock doves, and then people go, you know, will say, oh, doves are so wonderful, they're so peaceful, <laughs> they're That's so what lovely, pigeons are. Yes. and pigeons are doves, and, um, and I'm interested to know, like, there's... Right now, where I work, there's a courtyard, and we serve people during the day, and so there's crumbs and stuff around. And there is this group of birds who come in the afternoon, yeah. after everyone's left. Yeah. And the first one that comes is, is a pigeon mm -hmm. named Theodore, that Cecile has named. Nice. <laughs> and he comes, and he sort of prances around for a little while and gets a little crumbs, and then there's two crows that come. And they come every day. Yeah. And they come around the same time. Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to know if the, if you had any sort of insight as into like, you know, what's happening there. Food, probably. But well, yes, also, but you know, but the timing is so interesting. Too. Yeah, I mean, crows. Uh, you know, I mean, there are so many books out on how intelligent crows are, and um, and there's a piece in the book about a, a friend of mine, um, really my colleague at Emily Carr University. We were the only two people in the in the Sorry. <laughs> um, I don't know what that was. Um, <laughs> anyway, the only two people in the department, uh, Julie Andreev, and she's actually a very well-known, internationally known artist. And she, her recent work um, is about trees and sound, but she did a long um, section on, or a piece on uh, crows that would come every day to her... Um, uh, roof garden. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know why the pigeon would come first and then the crows, but maybe they're just hanging out waiting for the pigeon to get up and <laughs> oh, it must be time to <laughs> right. go over to them. I, I don't know. That's an interesting question because unless you really sit and and just watch, you never know what animals do because you're so you know all of us were so busy with our own lives and I, that's one of the reasons why I like Julie's work so much because you know that ability to just focus mm -hmm. on one particular animal that is in your world and actually the crows started leaving her gifts because she was giving them water and then 
Mm-hmm. She, they started leaving her gifts of all kinds. Mm-hmm. I love it. So if you're, if you're good, they might start leaving <laughs> <the> gifts. I <laughs> know. <laughs> I'm working on them. <laughs> Any other questions? I'll ask this questions. young man. Well, quick one. I was just going back to the first passage. I, I'm just. I have an image in my head, but what is a waggle dance? <laughs> what is that? And could you perform one? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Their little back ends go brrrr, like that. And, oh. and this was uh, Von Frisch. Um, they tuck under. I'm sorry? They tuck under a little. Oh, they, they tuck under yeah, a little. Okay. They, you know more about this than I do. Um, <laughs> no, no, really. I mean, you know, I'm, I have broad knowledge, not deep. And so um, that, but that is so it goes under i guess like when they wet yeah okay so a more up and down maybe well it's like a little waggle but it's just like you can see the little point like they're mm-hmm. going i'm allergic to bees so i <laughs> try to learn everything about <laughs> <laughs> and and that's what a waggle dance is and what's interesting is that what von frisch discovered was that was a language that was how they bees communicated with each other wow. so again People who are out there in the field, not in labs, hopefully, but in out in the field, and many of the people that I quoted, I tried to quote mostly and do the research, look at research from people who were ethologists and field biologists, um, uh, you know, who spent some of them, you know, their whole lives with one particular species, like Konstolbachikov, in the second chapter, is all about communication and his goal um, and he was able to do this was to prove that prairie dogs have a language and it you know is a language you know in terms of having different parts that mean different things and and very much um, about all communicating between prairie dogs so. I had a, more of a substantive question, too, <laughs> what I was curious about, which was, like, you touched on it with the distinction between creativity and innovation. Yeah. But it strikes me that, you know, we often talk about um, creativity um, in technology. Yes. Mm-hmm. Can you speak about the, the relationship between animals and technology? <laughs> and also, yeah. like, it's right. it strikes me that, like, we often see um, the capa- intelligent capacity of animals in rewilding. Um, yes. In, er- in areas where yes. um, technology is receding, human influence is receding in an area, yeah. and, and animals come back into an area. That's good. So the question is? The relationship between animals and technology. Well, and whether yeah. there's a kind of... Um, I don't know. It's interesting because what the first before I wrote, I did an edited book called Genetic Technologies and Animals, um, Leonardo's Choice: Genetic Technologies and Animals, and that's an edited book that I asked a number of people, biologists and philosophers, and artists, um, who else, uh, landscape architect, uh, all different kinds of people, to actually talk about the impact of technology on animals. But before that. I actually had a book proposal called Wild Li- Wildlife and Technology. I think that was the title. And I, I, ne- I, I didn't get very far with it um, for many reasons. Part, part of it was just personal. But um, it's interesting because, you know, I, my feeling is that we've put everything into technology and as somebody with a you know a background in computer technology i i understand that i mean i'm addicted to my computer unfortunately um but the the kinds of technologies that we think will save us will not because if you look at for instance, be, uh, beavers 
and their impact on the environment, on the habitats, um, and biodiversity. No, no matter what we do with technology, we cannot mimic that behavior. Um, and there, I have an article that the scientist asked, asked me to do, and that was pretty much the topic. Um, and that, that just is something that is really frustrating to me. There are many things that we can do with technology, but they're all about us. And even when we try to use them to make life better for animals, they're really still all about us. So again, I don't, I think we're missing a lot. And, I, and, and I'm not saying it's all in the book, and oh, if you read this, you will know everything, because what I learned from the book is, good Lord, I know nothing. We know nothing. There are many scientists who know a lot, but we, there's so much more to know about the rest of the world. And hopefully we learn it before it disappears. Ramona. Just sort of adjacent to that, I was thinking, you know, humans create stories and narratives to better understand things ritually and to share knowledge and information and yeah. commune. And often we use animals as representations of human foibles or qualities yes. or life yeah. in some way. How might we change that in a way to kind of more fully represent the reality of animals' existence you know, for themselves, to, to de understand their world more deeply, if that makes any sense. Well, and that's where I think our creativity comes in. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of qualities of creativity um, that people find very difficult to practice, and that that's often being flexible, of being open to other uh, ways of thinking to sort of putting aside your assumptions and actually sort of opening yourself up to something and saying, oh, I don't understand this. Let's look at this. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I do think that we create our create. We were always telling ourselves we're creative. And yet very often we're not because we don't do any of those things. But, you know, I think if we, <laughs> my grandson, <laughs> if we could do that, if we could take on those creative behaviors, I think that would be helpful. That's my, <laughs> that's my sort of answer to everything is creativity. <laughs> um, but I do think it, it's, to, it, it's, it is a universal quality. So I, having taught many, many people, I find every, everyone can be creative in their own way and what's meaningful to them. <laughs> All right. So, well, I think that's, that's a good, good place to that's stop. Good, that's yeah. a wrap. <laughs> um, the book is The Creative Lives of Animals. Um, if you're at home, you can, of course, order it online. We're here in Glen Park in San Francisco. We want to say thank you to everyone who came out on a cold, rainy night. Here is Giovanni, her grandson, my son. Um, and thank you to Bird and Beckett for hosting this event. Um, please go to your local bookstore, wherever you are out in the world. Buy some books, uh, hopefully this book, and uh, wishing everybody a uh, happy holiday season. Thank you thank all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Okay. <laughs>